Welcome to Computing at Home with Digital Schoolhouse. My name is Estelle, otherwise known as CompSciGeek. I'm a computing teacher and I also develop resources for the programme. We specialise in delivering computing workshops that are accessible, educational and fun. You're watching part one of our Switched On Sound workshop. This part of the workshop is unplugged, meaning you don't need any tech to take part, just a device to watch the video on. You can watch any of our previously streamed workshops on our YouTube channel. Just search YouTube for Digital Schoolhouse. To all learners watching, remember you can pause the video at any time to take notes, collect your thoughts or take part in the workshop alongside me. The Digital Schoolhouse team are ready and waiting in the chat should you have any questions throughout. Otherwise, I'll be taking five minutes at the end of the stream to answer your questions. So uh, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. Parents and guardians, you might want to watch the next bit as it explains how to access our resources. But after that, feel free to sit nearby or supervise if you want to. Let's get started. OK. So for today's resources, what you're going to need is a copy of our worksheets, which I have here on the visualizer. Um, there are a lot of worksheets across the two parts of this workshop. So just be aware there's about 16 sheets to print off. Um, some you'll be using in part one and some in part two. And I'll talk through the worksheets that you'll need as we go through this workshop. OK, so those are the worksheets you're going to need. As usual, you'll find them on our website which I'll just talk you through where to find them now. So if you head over to the Digital Schoolhouse website, that's digitalschoolhouse.org.uk, you'll find the resources under the resources tab. Click on live workshops. If you scroll down slightly, find the switched on sound workshop um, information. Click on switched on sound. Just waiting for this to, to load, there you go. And the resource that you're going to need is the DSH Worksheets um, SOS, Switch On Sound Live. And as I said, you'll need all of the worksheets for across both parts of the workshop. Um, and there are 16 sheets in total. Obviously you don't need to print off the first one. So that is the worksheets that you're going to need for today's session. And there are a few that aren't, that won't be used until the second session, but I'll talk you through them as we go through the workshop. Um, as usual, if you don't have access to a uh, printer, what you could do is for most of the, uh, for part one, you'd be able to use notepad and a pen and paper, um, or a pen and paper, and that'd be absolutely fine. And I'll talk you through how to do things on paper if you prefer as we go along. Okay, so let me just make sure the visualizer is working because it looks like it's just timed itself out. So just let me do that for a moment. There we go. Yes. Yeah, so I was just saying that you could use a notepad and pen if you prefer rather than using um, paper. So feel free to use whatever you prefer for the worksheet workshop today. But you might want to print off the sheets if you do have access to a printer because some of them are quite specialised. OK, so that's what you're going to need for today's workshop. So make sure you've got those handy um, when you're ready to start. OK. Right, so let's get started on today's workshop. Okay, so today you are watching Switch On Sound. This is part one of a two part workshop. This part, as I said earlier, is completely unplugged, meaning that you don't need any tech to take part, just a device to watch the uh, videos. And um, you need a copy of the worksheets or a notepad or paper and a pen. So in this workshop, you're going to learn about binary representation of deanery. Deanery is the number system that we use normally. So the base 10 number system that you use in maths. Um, we're also going to look at a brief history of digital sound. We're going to look at how sound can be sampled and stored in a digital form, how sampling intervals and other factors affect the size of a, of a sound file and the quality of its playback. And in that, we're going to look a little bit at sample size, bit rate and sampling frequency. And we're going to look at a little bit why you need to compress um, sound files. So that is what we're going to be looking at across today's workshop. 
So the first thing we're going to have a little look at is automated music. And this is kind of where everything starts from. So the earliest automated mu music, and well, possibly the, the earliest programmable machine, was a music player designed by the Manimusa brothers in the 9th century Baghdad. Um, the machine could play different tunes by adjusting the patterns on the device, and the device was steam powered, and sounds were made by blowing steam through the flute. And here is a couple of examples of the, um, of like, some uh, players that they've recreated uh, by following the manuscript and and building something like the Banu Musa brothers would have created to give you an idea of what it looks like. So we're going to watch a little video now which is another example of a music player which works in a similar way to the uh, Banu Musa's uh, brothers designs. This one is um, hand cranked meaning that the, the person who plays the tune has to actually turn the wheel themselves. But if you imagine this was steam powered so the wheel was turned by steam you get an idea of how um, some of these early automated mu music players actually worked. So let's have a little look at the first of our videos. Okay, so how cool was that? So that is an example of a very early um, style of music player. Obviously, this was built in uh, fairly recently using plastic and uh, using plastic and cardboard. Um, so it's not actually it's a reproduction. It's not a, a real um, early device, but it gives you an idea of how these early devices actually worked. Um, hopefully, you enjoyed that. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a go at making our own music player. OK, so normally I'd do this in a as a class activity and everyone in the class would have a different uh, movement that they would, they would do. So that's why it says a class music player. But because we don't have that luxury, this is going to be a um, one man band for today's workshop. So be ready to play your instruments. So this, if you want to, we, the way I'm going to do this is going to be using um, different um, musical sounds that you can make using parts of your body. So things like clapping, um, slapping, stomping, that kind of thing. But if you want to and you're feeling um, musical, there's no reason why you can pause a stream, go and grab yourself some different bits and pieces uh, from around your house. You might have a drum or something that you have in your house, or you might want to get some pots and pans and you can use those as, instead if you want to. But what we're going to be doing is using different parts of our hands like clapping, slapping, thighs and uh, stomping of feet and things like that. So you don't need to have any music musical instruments for this but if you do fancy it that's um, obviously up to you and absolutely fine if you want to have a go at doing that. So what we're going to have a go at making is a um, a graphical score. Now, this is a visual method of writing music down using shapes and symbols to represent notes and um, instruments. So in my musical score you're going to be using the different um, shapes to represent different um, sounds so or uh, movements. So in this case the um, round circle that looks like that is going to be you doing a clap. Okay so whenever you see that circle do a clap and the next one is this one which is the square. So the um, green square is going to be a stomp. Okay I haven't really got, I've got shoes on so it doesn't sound very um, loud but there you go, a stomp. That's the square. The next one is the um, star. So if you see the star, the yellow star, you're going to do a click. Okay. If you can't click your fingers, you could do a click of the, the tongue if you want to, whatever you prefer. And the next one is going to be a um, triangle, a red triangle, and that's going to be a swish sound. So the way that I do a swish is like this. Okay. So we've got our four shapes that um, will turn up in our uh, music box, um, uh, music box um, program. Sorry, my brain's gone a bit slow today. So just to recap, we've got a clap, we've got a stomp, we've got the swish, and we've got the click. Okay. So I'll quickly recap all of those moves again, just in case, like me, you might have forgotten. So we've got the clap, which is the circle. We've got the stomp which is the um, green uh, square. We've got the click, which is the yellow star. And finally, we've got the swish, 
which is the red triangle. So those are the movements that you're going to be looking for. Right, so let's have a go at doing a little bit of automated music using my lovely um, program that I've created using Scratch. So I'm just going to hop onto Scratch and get that open for you so you can see what it looks like. So this is my class music box that I designed in Scratch. So if you fancy having a go at building one of these, you could have a go at doing this yourself sometime. Um, have a look inside, you can go to see inside. This is part of the Digital Schoolhouse Studio. So if you do want to have a little nosy at what I've built and how I've built this, then go to see inside and you can play around with building your own version if you fancy having a go at that. So if I click on the flag to start, you can see that as it plays, the different shapes move over the line. So the idea is that you do the different sounds by clapping, stomping, swishing and clicking whenever it hits that black line there. OK, so I'm just going to stop it and we'll start it again because I was not ready and I'm going to full size it so that we're ready to have a go together. OK, so just quick re recap in case you've forgotten, because I I might well have forgotten. So if I've forgotten, I'm sure some of you might have done this. Uh, the circle is a clap. The square is the stomp, the star is the click, and the, re the um, triangle is the swish. Okay, so let's hit the ground running and have a go at doing this. So, ah, it's really hard. <laughs> I'm sure that you'll be better than me, then I'm useless at this. <laughs> okay, you get the idea. Okay, so this normally would be done with a class and each part of the classroom would be taking on a different uh, shape. So you might find it easier if you, like me, tried to do all of it at once and it was just a bit all over the place. You might want to do another run where you just focus on two of the shapes. So this time I'm going to have a go at just doing the uh, clap and the stomp and not worry about the other shapes because I was just all over the place. My <laughs> coordination was not very good then. Let's try that again. Oh yeah, I can do that. <laughs> That's much easier to do. And then it starts to get a bit harder because it gets faster. Okay, you get the idea. Okay, so there's my, my music box and I've got you hopefully follow along with the music box uh, by making your own sounds as you follow the different shapes. Excellent. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a go at designing our own graphical score. Okay, so we're going to do this using the worksheet. So this is the very first of our worksheets. So along the top, you're going to decide what symbols you're going to use and what they're going to represent. So you can see in this example, I've got different shapes that I've used. So I've used like a swirl to represent a clap, the star to represent a click, the moon to represent a stamp, and a cross to represent a whoop. Like whoop. Um, so that's what I've got in that bit. So then I've put them down in my scraffle score. So you can see that every um, two beats, I've got that clap. So it's like one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And then I've got my other things going. So I've got one, two, one, two. And you can see I've started to build up the different um, sounds on my graphical score. So why not have a go at doing that yourself? Grab yourself the worksheet, which is this one, fill it in and have a go at um, designing yourself a graphical score that you could then follow um, by reading the different um, movements or sounds that you're going to make as you're going through that. So I'm going to have a go at doing that now. You have a go as well and then you can have a go at uh, demonstrating it to people in your household. So I'm going to put my different things and this time I'm going to really concentrate on doing things that I can actually do um, in sequence and also in parallel by doing different things together. So I can do a clap and a stomp together. So I'm going to do both of those. So I'm going to have clap, 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 clap. And then every other clap, I'm going to have a stomp at the same time. There we go. And then between them, I'm going to add some other um, movements. And I'm going to have a circle, which is going to be a thigh slap. And that's going to go in there. And finally, right at the end, we're going to go have a whoop at the end, I think. And I'm going to do a triangle for that. And that goes in there. Okay, so obviously when you're reading this, your graphical score, you put it this way round. 
okay? So once you've completed your graphical score, obviously you could add some colour to it if you fancied it, but then you can have a go at actually doing the graphical score movements or the sounds um, by working your way through it. So I go, I, I might have to just practice a little bit because I'm, I haven't done this before, so let's see if I can do it. So I'm gonna go, um, one, two, uh, <laughs> and then whoop at the end. Okay, let's try it again. So, one, two, one, two, one, two. <laughs> it's so hard because I have to really think about it. whoop. And I'm also talking to you as well, which makes it really, really hard. Okay, let's try one more time. And I'm sure that you'll be practicing yours as well, not just laughing at me. <laughs> okay, one, two, one, two, one two, one, woo! There we go, I managed to do it that time. So there you go, that's an example of a graphical score which I'm using by uh, drawing my different shapes um, on my sheet and then having a key which tells me what each of the shapes mean. Okay, so it's a graphical score, so it's a way of representing music. So if you actually had some instruments and you wanted to have a go at doing this using musical instruments, you could do exactly the same thing, but instead of writing things like the star as a clap, the star might be um, a beat on the drum or something like that. Okay, so that's how you could use a graphical score with some musical instruments if you want to. Hopefully you had fun having a go at that activity. Do feel free to pause the stream if you've not quite finished it. Um, that's absolutely fine. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is something called punch cards. Now, punch cards are a really important part of early computing. And unsurprisingly, they've also had an influence in early sound um, production using automated devices. So we're gonna little bit, have a little look at the history of music and punch cards, and we're gonna have a go at doing a little bit of binary representation using punch cards. So hopefully this will be something new to you that you haven't seen before. So first of all, um, early automated music, uh, again, as I said, it started to use punch cards. So in 1881, Jules Carpen Carpentier, uh, he demonstrated his Melograph rep Repeteur in Paris. It was a machine that both recorded the notes played by shaving slots into the paper that moved across the keys and then played them back using a separate mechanism. And here you can see an example of it. Um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at an example of a piano melodica. Now this was invented in the late 1800s, so around a similar time to the um, melograph, which um, uses a very similar process and it gives you an, an idea of how using these um, punch cards um, it could play different bits of music. So we're going to have a little look at that now. So I'm going to jump over and pop on video two, which is going to hopefully give you an idea of the piano melodica and how that used punch cards to play some music. So that you can see there, the piano melodica used the punch cards, which you can sort of see um, slowly moving through the machine, and using the different holes um, on the machine meant that different sounds, different notes would be played. Um, so it uses punch cards as a way of representing the different sounds. So hopefully you enjoyed watching that because I think it's really, really cool. I get really excited about things like that. I think it's just amazing that people had these thoughts of how they're going to design um, a mechanism that used the, the holes to uh, be able to represent different sounds. So next 
session, the next part of this workshop, you're going to be having a go at actually representing sounds using punch cards in the Nin Nintendo Labo piano. Um, and you can see that's what the next worksheet is, but we're not going to be doing that today. But I just wanted to show you that you that is something that you're going to start to look at next time. So do join me next time. Even if you don't have the Labo piano, if you're just interested in seeing how that works, we're going to look at punch cards um, and using them on the Labo piano. But before we do that, we're going to delve into a little bit more about punch cards and how they're used in computing because they've been used in computing um, really from the very beginning of computers so we're going to have a little look at that now and then we're going to do some examples of using punch cards to represent some different bits of text so here you can see um, the um, this is the analytical engine which was designed by Charles Babbage in the early 1830s and he came up with an idea to use punch cards similar to the one that you saw used in the in the in the melodica the piano melodica to represent data and instructions and what would become the first designs for a computer and this is the analytical engine you can actually see this in the British Museum so you could even go and have a look at it when you're able to so um, it's just such a cool machine I just find it absolutely fascinating that people were creating computers Computers out of steam powered engines using punch cards. How cool is that? So Ada Lovelace, who worked with Charles Babbage on the analytical ending engine, and she's thought to be the very first computer programmer, um, she thought the engine would one day be capable of making music. And she said the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. And you can see here in this slide an example of the punch cards that the analytical engine um, was designed to use. So you can see there, it looks very similar to the punch cards that I showed you that we're going to be using on the um, the Labo piano next time. So how cool is that? So uh, a little bit of a link to history going on there. Right, so what we're going to do next is we're going to have a look at binary. Now we've talked about binary in previous workshops, so if it's completely new to you, don't worry, we're going to be talking about it in quite a lot of detail and I'll be explaining how it works as we go along as well. So I've got a couple of worksheets for this and I'll, I'll talk you through how to access this if you don't have the worksheets to hand as well. So don't worry if you, if you don't have the worksheets, you can do this on paper. So let me talk you through a little bit about binary. So binary um, is used because computers are electrical machines. Fundamentally, everything on a computer has to be converted into electrical pulses in order for the computer to process it. And the way that computers do that is using lots and lots of switches to control these electrical pulses. So why use lots of switches? Because a light switch can either be on or off. In fact, any switch can be on or off. It only has two states, on or off. And that's why everything in binary can be stored as ones and zeros, because one represents on and zero represents off. And we call that binary. So computers contain lots of these switches and it's the combination of switching them on and off again that gives them meaning. So in this example here, you can see that we've got two switches. We've got one switch on, one switch off. But if we were going to be representing this as a number, this would be in place value of um, the number of ones which means no ones and this would be in the place value for the number of twos in binary because remember if you watched our previous streams you might already know that binary goes up in twos each time so we have it goes in it doubles each time so it goes zero so it goes number of ones number of twos number of fours number of eights doubles each time for each place value so this would be the number two because we have one lot of twos and no lots of ones so you can see that turning the different switches on and off gives meaning to them and if you're interested in finding out a bit more about that and how that works with letters, stay tuned because that's exactly what we're going to be looking at next. But before we do that, we want to look at bigger numbers because obviously having the number two means you could represent two possible things, maybe three if you include the zero, the, the number zero. But actually, there's how many number, no, how many letters in the alphabet? 26. Yeah. So we need to have at least 26 possibilities of different binary numbers to be able to represent enough for just capital letters. But there's not just capital letters. There's capital letters, there's lowercase letters, there's symbols, there's all sorts of different things going on. So we need to have a higher number that we can use to represent all of these different things. So this is another binary number here. And again, we think about the place values. We've got the place value of ones, twos, fours, eights. 16s and 32s. So I'm going to grab my notepad and then we can work out what this number would be. So we've got one lot of 32, so we have 32. We've got no 16s, but we have got one eight, 
So we do 32 plus 8. Then we've got no 4s, so we don't need to write that down. But we've got 1, 2, so we're going to do plus 2. And we've got 1, 1, so we're going to add a 1. So if I quickly show you what I've just done on my notepad, I've just done 32 plus 8 plus 2 plus 1. And I'm just going to do a simple calculation. That will convert that binary number into its decimal equivalent or its deanery equivalent. So 32 plus 8 plus 2 plus 1. So 32 plus 8 is 40 plus 2 is um, 42 plus 1 is 43. So this number here, the one that you can see represented on the screen, is the number 43 in decimal or deanery. That's just two different ways of talking about the number system that we use in maths. OK, so what you might have noticed in your pack of worksheets is there are lots, uh, there is some place value, um, uh, place value mats is the word I was trying to think of. Okay, so what you do with these is you can pop them together. I'm just going to fold over the end of this one, like so, and then you can use them to help you with calculating binary numbers. Okay, so I've got it from one all the way up to 128 at this end. So a, um, a, uh, sorry, my brain is really slow this morning. A eight digit binary number, so a binary number which has eights, ones or zeros can be representing the number 255 up to the maximum of 255. So that gives you an idea of how many different things we can represent using an eight digit binary number. So that's what the place value is there for. It's there to help you with representing your binary. Okay, so you can use that if you want to. If you don't have the worksheets, you could do the same thing by writing the place values out on a piece of paper. So exactly the same thing, just make sure you give yourself some space underneath. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128 and that gives you eight digits for binary numbers okay so that's what you could do if you want to so if you don't have access to the sheets pop it on a bit of paper instead okay so let's have a look at what we're going to be thinking about next so a little bit more theory for you about how binary numbers work and what we're talking about in terms of binary numbers so first of all a binary digit can be contracted into the word bit, like that, okay? That means that in, uh, when we see the word bit in conjunction with binary, we're actually meaning binary digit. A single binary digit is called a bit. But how does that relate to controlling a computer? It's all about representing numbers, and we've touched on that a little bit already. So as we said, it's all about lots of switches, and we talked about this previously. We have a place value, nothing under the place value of one, but one under the place value of two, which gives us the number two. This example, see if you can work it out before I do. So first of all, you need to do eight plus two, because that's the only places we've got ones under the place value. So eight plus two is 10. So one zero, one zero is the number 10 in binary. And how about this one? So we've got, a 1 under the 64, a 1 under the 32, a 1 under the 8, a 1 under the 4, nothing under the 2, and 1 under the 1. I'm going to get my notepad and work it out. So I'm doing 64 plus 32 plus 8 plus 4 plus 1. So what number are we going to end up with this one? Let's work it out. So... Um, So what did you end up with? I ended up with 109. Yeah, so that's the binary number being represented here. So 1101101 in decimal or in deanery is the number 109. Very good. Okay, and so what's that got to do with holes? Okay, it's a really good question. We've been talking about punch cards. We've looked at the piano melodica and we looked at how that used a punch card to represent different sounds. So how can we go from binary to punch cards? What, how does it work? First thing we need to know about is a little bit of, again, a bit of theory, and that is that machine code is the code written directly in the language of computers, binary. So when we're talking about binary and using it as instructions on the computer, we're talking about machine code. So just be aware of that. Um, binary, when it's being processed by the computer, is called machine code. But, but humans don't speak in binary. I'm pretty sure that I don't speak 
go around and speak to people in one zero one zero one zero. No, I'm sure none of you out there do. Humans don't speak in binary. So we need to have a better way of communicating with the computers. And what we do with that is we use a translator. Okay, so that is a way of translating from the binary representation that the computer needs into the way that the computers can, can represent it, in the way a human can represent it, sorry. So we're gonna have a look at an example of something called COBOL. COBOL is a programming language that was used um, on computers and it was used, uh, it's one of the first programming languages that started to convert between um, the machine code language, which uh, originally everyone had to actually code completely in binary, into a language that was a little bit more, a bit closer to English. So you can see here in this example that we have some COBOL programming. We can see that there are some instructions that are written in English um, and you can probably have some idea of what's going on here. So we've got input, we've got output and we've got um, a couple of numbers that are being stored and it sort of makes some sense in English. But obviously the computer can't process that. It has to still be processed in binary. So how does it do that? Now, this is where this wonderful lady comes in. Her name is Grace Hopper. And in 1952, she devised a way of converting computer programs written in English into machine code using punch cards. And this is where the link comes in. So a COBOL punch card here, you can see along the top is a single instruction that's being processed but it's actually being processed by the computer in binary by using punch card, uh, by using holes in the card to represent that instruction. So every single um, letter in the instruction is being stored using its binary equivalent by turning, by using these punch cards, by using the holes in the punch card. And the way this worked was using a digit. So you can see here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine and you can see where the, the holes are being punched in it. And it also used the zone. And the instruction itself, as I said, is along the top. But the computer doesn't process the instruction at all. The computer is processing the holes, which represent the binary that the machine code that the computer can actually work with. So let's have a little bit of a closer look at this digit and zone thing that's going along with the, the COBOL punch card. So this is an example of the COBOL character set. So you can see it represented lowercase letters, capital letters and numbers, okay? So it only could represent so many things. It uses zones. So the zone is used for multiple letters, but then the digit would change for each one. You also got something here called hexadecimal, which we're not gonna carry, uh, go into today, um, but that's a different number system. Um, so don't worry about that, it's just there because um, it's part of how, compu how computer programmers would decide on um, a different way of representing the, the letters, uh, sorry, the numbers, the binary numbers, because it's a slightly simpler way of representing it rather than writing it in binary. So it's sometimes used as an as a in-between step. But don't worry, we're not going to look at hexadecimal today. So uh, I've done a simplified version of the character set for COBOL. So a character set just means this is all the characters that are possible to be represented in COBOL. And a character, remember, if you've watched any of our previous workshops about binary, is anything that can be represented on your keyboard or in your machine in this example. And in this case, it's, it's lowercase letters, spaces, blank, you see it there, um, capital letters and numbers. And they're all the characters that can be represented in the COBOL character set. And I did a simplified version of that, which is included in the sets of resources. And you can see that on the visualizer now. So this is a um, simplified version using binary. So you can see that we're just using capital letters and I've included one bit of punctuation for you. Um, so capital letters using the zones and the digits in the same way as the original COBOL character set worked. So you can see that A through to I uses the same zone then J to R uses the same zone, and then S to Z uses the same zone. So you've got three different zones to represent sets of, of letters, and then the digit changes based on which letter it is. So A is zone 1100, but digit 0001, whereas C is the same zone, 1100, but the digit for that is 0011. So that is a simplified version of the character set for COBOL. And 
I hear you are thinking about how does that represent in, what would that be represented in decimal or in deanery? I've included that for you as well. And you can see there is the same character set, but represented using decimal numbers rather than the binary equivalent. So if you fancy, you could do it in binary and work it out yourself, but it's there as well for you. So you can see that the zone 12 is used for A through to I, zone 13 is used for J through to R, and zone 14 is used for S through to Z. And you can see I'm using digits one up to nine for those different uh, characters as well. So that's where, where the cards then start to be used um, in the Cobalt Punch cards. Okay, so I've done one here for you. I've already um, removed the punch holes. You can have a go at seeing if you can work out what letter is being re uh, represented. I'll do a little tiny bit more explanation before I uh, let you go off and have a go at doing this and then I'll give you the answers in a moment. Um, that's just to sh explain the um, zones, okay? So let me just hop back onto the presentation so I can show you what that I mean by that. So the different zones are at the very top of the COBOL punch cards. So let me show you an example. So this is a COBOL punch card that's being used there you go, to represent the left, the word dot. Now, you can see the zones are already there in binary, 1100, 1101, 1110. So if we wanted to do the, the conversion, so you can look it up on your sheets if you want to. There's your sheets, yeah, you can look them up. So we can see that 1100 is this uh, is going to be a letter A to H. So we know that it's in zone this zone, which is zone um, 12. You can check it, check it on there. Then O is in zone 13, and then T is in zone 14. And we can tell the different positions of the zones on the punch card itself. So zone 11, oh sorry, zone 12 is at the very top, just here on that line. Um, zone 13 is roughly in the middle, and zone um, 14 is down here over the top of a zero. Okay, so 12, 13, 14. So you're going to look at the positions of those for the zone and then use that in conjunction with, there you go, you'll use that in conjunction with the character to be able to work out specifically which letter it is in each range of letters. So we've got the different ranges of letters here. Okay, so I'll just show you how that works. So let me just pop this back on the screen. Okay, so there you can see we've got the different zones and as I said, D is in zone 12, which is up here. D is in zone 12, which is up here. Then we've got O, which is in zone 13 in the middle there. And then we've got the T, which is in zone 14, which is over the top of the zero. And then we use that in conjunction with the character. So we have to look at which character has been punched out. So which number has been punched out. So in this case, we can see the digit in this one is digit four, which in binary would be 0100. Then for the O, we've got um, digit six being punched out, which is 0110. And we can see that digit three has been punched out here, which is 0011. There you go, four, six, and three. And when we put those two things together, we can then represent the whole, um, the word itself. So in this case, dot. So we can see that we've got the zone. So zone 12 plus um, digit four means the letter D. Zone 13 plus the digit six means O. And don't, zone 14 plus the digit three means the letter T. So you can see how the Cobalt Punch card is put all those, those different things together in order to represent a word. So here is my first message on my Cobalt Punch card. See if you can work it out. So start by working out the zones up the top. So I'm going to do it on a bit of paper myself and then I'll talk you through the answer in a minute. So I'm going to do the zones first. Think about what I told you about the zones a minute ago. And then once you've done the zones, you can then add in the digits. And then you can use your character set sheet to work out what word I'm spelling. Okay, I'm going to jump over onto the visualizer now to show you the answer and talk you through how I'm looking up the, the actual answer for each character. If you need to spend a bit longer and you want a bit longer having a go at doing this, then pause the stream now because I'm going to go through the answer. OK, so what I've got here is I've got zone 12. So I know that this first letter is going to be somewhere in here and I've got digit four. 
So I'm going to start with the 12 and find the 4, which gives me a letter D. So I know the character for that first bit of the punch card is a D. Next, we've got 13 and 6. So 13 and 6, that gives me an O. So I've got D, O. And then I've got zone 12 again, and the letter is going to be uh, digit 7, which means it's a G. So my secret word was dog, and that is the punch card representing the word dog in Cobol. Okay, hopefully you enjoyed having a little go at that. Here is a longer one for you to have a go at. Let me just hop back onto the presentation. There you go, see so D-O-G, dog, that's the answer. And here is a longer one for you to have a go. See if you can work out what this one is. I'm going to have a go on, on the punch card sheet. So this is the next one over here on the visualiser. So it's this one you're going to have a go at doing. See if you can work it out and I'll go through what the answer is in just a moment. As usual, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a go at um, put, popping in the answer myself. And then I'll tell you when I'm going to go through the answer so that you're ready um, should you need a little bit longer. Okay. So I'm going to do my zones first, just like I showed you in the example one. And then I'm going to do the digits. Remember, all you do with the digits is you write down the number that's been punched out. Okay, and then I'm going to look it up in the character set and then we'll see what you end up with. See if you end up with the same as me. Okay, right, I've got my answer. If you need a little bit longer, feel free to pause the stream now because I'm going to show you the answer on the visualizer. Pause it if you need to. I'll pop the pause up just to say, you know, can you pause it here if you need to? Because here is the answer. It says Hello World. And the reason we use Hello World for a lot of programs is one because it was one of the first things that was um, sent over the internet. So Hello World is often used as one of the very first things that people get to program when they're writing in a programming language, which you are. You're writing in COBOL at the moment. So there you go. That was that one, that worksheet there with Hello World um, with a gap in it this time where you had the space between the different words. Very well done. Hopefully you managed to follow along that with me as well. So I'll quickly show you again the answer in case you needed to see that again. So there is the original message and you can see there is Hello World along the top of the punch card. Hopefully you managed to get that one in there as well. So you can see that the um, the space in the between the words is just left with a unpunched part of the card. Oh, we've got another longer one. See if you can have a go at my longer one. OK, so I'll leave it up on the screen for you for a bit while I fill it in on my on the visualizer and then we'll see if you can get the answer. So let's have a go. Do the same process, so you start by doing the zones. So I'm going to do my zones first. So the clever thing is that although we're doing this in decimal numbers, the computer, in actual fact, is processing this in binary code. How cool is that? How clever. Let's fill those in. Okay, I've done all my, my zones, now I'm going to do the digits. So the digits are a little bit easier than the zones, I think. Because you're just again looking to see which numbers have been punched out. Oops, I did the wrong one there. 
I made my usual mistake of not doing this with um, in pencil so I could rub it out easily. You might find it easier as well. You could use a ruler to help you guide you along which one you're working on. If you're finding it a little bit tricky to track down, that's a good way of working if you're struggling a little bit. I'm on to my last word now. Where are you up to, I wonder? As usual, if you do need to pause, just spend a bit longer over it, that's absolutely fine. Right, so that's all my numbers in. Now I can do my characters and calculate and work out what letters I've got. and six and Thirteen. Oh, I see what I've done on that last one. It's a little bit trickier than I realised. Well, let's see if you've worked that one out or not. Did you spot the extra hole that had been punched? Okay, so this is what I've ended up with. Pause it if you need to before, if you're not quite there. So pause the stream if you need to, because I'm going to go through the answers now. Okay, so I've got hello and welcome to Digital Schoolhouse with an exclamation mark, which I made a mistake to start with because I ended up with a Q at the end there. I thought that can't be right. But then I looked again and I just said I've got the two and the eight punched out. So two plus eight, a little bit like we showed you the binary, would give you a 10, which gives you that last digit, which is the exclamation mark down there. Okay, so very well done if you managed to have a go at doing that, the hello and welcome to Digital Schoolhouse. Okay. I'll just show you the answer again in case you didn't quite catch it. And I'll show you what that looks like along the top with the um, the instruction along the top. Remember, it's the instruction that we're decoded in, decoding into the binary representation. So along the top, we have hello and welcome to Digital Schoolhouse with an exclamation mark. Very well done. Right. Next thing I would like you to have a go at doing is have a go at writing your own name in COBOL. So you've got now a blank version of the COBOL punch card, which I'll just show you on the screen now. So here is a blank version of the COBOL punch card. So the first thing you need to do is you're gonna write your name in this character bit along the bottom here, because we're gonna be converting that into the, um, the holes in the punch card. So make sure that you put your name into this space here, because that's your first point. So my name is Estelle. So I'll pop it in like that. Then I'm gonna use my character seat sheet to look up what each of the zones and digits will be for each letter. So I'm gonna start with E. So I've got a zone of 12 and a digit of five. So I'm gonna put 12 in there and a five in there. Then S, so I'll find the letter S. I've got 14 and two. Then I've got T, which is 14 and three. Then I've got E again, which I would know is 12 and five. 
and I've got two L's, 13 and 3. And I've got E again, which I've already looked up, which is 12 and 5. And then you transfer that into the holes in the punch card itself. So if you really wanted to, you could actually punch the holes in your Cobol punch card yourself if you wanted to. Um, but I'm just going to do this by just drawing a box. So I've got 12 up here, so I'm going to make a hole there. Then I've got 14 and 2, so I know that 14 is here. And I've got another 14 there, so make another hole there. And I've got another 12, which will be up there. Then I've got a 13, which we know is right in the middle there. Then I've got another 13 there. And then I've got a 12 up there. So there's all my zones done. And then I'm going to do the digits. And the digits are really easy because all you do is you find the number and you punch a hole over the top of it. So there's my 2. And there's my 3. There's my 5. There's my 3. There's my 3. And there's my 5. So why don't you have a go as well, have a go at using the Cobol punch card, the blank one, and have a go at representing your name using Cobol, using a punch card. So have a go at doing that yourself. And once you've done that, if you've gone a little bit longer and you want to have a go at challenging yourself, why not have a go at doing the next sheet, which is just another blank one, where you can write your own message. And if you do that, why not send that over to me on Twitter or on Facebook? And I'll tell you the details of how to do that later. And I'll have a go at translating your COBOL punch card. So that is the last part of the COBOL punch card activity. So have a go at doing your name first. And if you've managed to do that and you've found that quite simple, have a go at doing a message. And why not send it to me on social media? I'd love to see it. So that is the COBOL punch cards. Let's have a look at what we're going to be doing next. Ah, yes. Can't talk about Grace Hopper without just a little bit more about her history. Now, Grace Hopper came up with the very first turn of phrase of, the, of a bug. So she was the very first person to come up with the concept of saying that there that there was a bug in the program because at that stage because computers were so massive you saw that little bit of a section of the analytical engine earlier that um, Charles Babbage created they were so big that literally if there was a bug stuck in the computer then it would cause major issues. And that's why we now talk about there being a bug in your program, which just means you might have typed something wrong, but because originally it literally meant there was a bug in your program. And in this case, it was a moth stuck in the computer. Um, so there you go. Uh, that's where that turn of phrase came from. And we can thank um, Grace Hopper for being the person who came up with that idea of having a bug in your computer. Right. So let's have a little bit more of the history of sound. So, so far, the machines we've looked at uh, recorded the mechanics needed to play the notes rather than the sound itself. They were more like robots that have been programmed to play an instrument rather than a CD that stores a digital version of the sound. In the next section, we're going to look at the history of how the recording of sound itself was invented. So how do we go from using punch cards to represent different notes, which is, as I said, just a representation of the, of the different numbers. And it was a little bit more like a robotic way of working. So actually recording the sound, actually representing the sound itself. And we're going to talk about exactly what's going on with that as we go through this next section. So um, I don't have to pronounce this man's name, so I apologise if I do it once sec. Edward um, Leon Scott de Martinville invented the first sound recording device, which was called the phonautograph, which was a device that worked in a similar way to the human ear. It had a gathering chamber where sound was focused onto one spot and the vibrations of the sound were then transferred to a moving stylus, which pressed ink into moving paper. And this was an example of a recording made on the phonautograph in 1859. So this is what I'm about to play you is the earliest known recording of, a hu of the human voice. And it's a French folk song called All Claire de la Lune. And it's sung by Edward Leon Scott de Martinville himself in 1860. So let's have a little listen to that. <laughs> OK, 
OK. Now, hopefully you heard that. It's very scratchy and really weird sounding. We can just about hear the man singing in the background like, kind of that kind of sound. Um, and that's the recorded sound that this um, autophonograph actually made. So how cool is that? So the earliest known sound recording of the human voice in 1860. So how does it work? To understand, we need to understand that, we need to understand a bit more about how sound itself is produced. So sound is produced when something vibrates. The vibrating body uses the medium, so it could be water, air, etc., around it to vibrate, and vibrations in the air are called travelling long longitude sorry, travelling longitude I can't speak today. Longitude <laughs> longitudinal waves, which we can hear. And here you can see an example of a wave here, which is um, as I said, the vibration of the sound. So going back to the phonautograph and how that works, the sound came in through the gathering chamber, was channeled through to a single point called the stylus, which is a bit like a needle. And that would then move in order to create the sound wave that you could then play back and listen to. And here you can see a closer um, like picture with the sound being forced through the needle, which is then scratching into the surface of the cylinder. And that would then make the recording sound. So how do we get different notes? And what do you notice about the sound waves reduced to make different notes? Now, we talk about pitch in terms of how high or low a note is. And these are the sound waves for different pitches of note. So the ones that are closer packed together will give you a higher note, and the ones that are further apart will give you a lower note. Frequency determines the pitch of a note and is the number of wave cycles in a second. So the higher the note, the higher the frequency of the sound waves. There's more sound waves packed into a smaller area. The lower the note, the lower the frequency of the sound wave. And here you can see the frequency is lower because there are less sound waves packed into the same amount of area. So how does this work with digital sound? So far, we've looked at how sound can be recorded by drawing the wave the sound makes. And we call that analog sound. And that's how record players work. But analog is a recording format that replicates the original sound using vibration. So I don't know if, you, if, if you've looked closely at a record player, you might notice it actually uses a needle and that needle sits on the record and as it goes round, it causes the vibrations that you can then hear being amplified through your speakers. So that's actually how a record works in a similar way to the auto autophonograph that we looked at earlier, how that recorded the sound and then played it back. So it works in a similar way. And you can imagine the needle on the record goes round and as it plays, as, it, as the record spins, it causes a vibration in that needle and then that's amplified so you can actually hear the sound that's being created. So that's analog sound. What we want to know next is how that is converted into digital sound because that is what you would need to actually represent it on a computer. So how do computers represent sound digitally? We've already discussed that computers represent everything using binary because of how they work. Remember those switches, ones and zeros? Yep, so it has to be represented in binary. So digital sound is also represented using binary. To do this, the sound wave is measured at regular intervals and this measurement is converted into binary. Let me show you what I mean on the next worksheet. So you can see here, I've got a sound wave and if I measure it at regular intervals, I'm just gonna get my ruler because I think it'll make it easier for me to see what I'm doing. Um, you can see that if it's measured at regular intervals, so we can see here, that point it's measured as a one, then at the two it's measured at minus 0 0.3, then at the three it's measured at 0 0.4. And if those are then converted into the binary equivalent of those numbers, we could then use that to recreate the sound wave because we'd have the points of where the different measurements would fall and then we could join them back up by putting a line that goes between those points and we'd be able to recreate the sound wave exactly as it originally appeared. So that is how a computer represents sound. Let's have a little go at representing this as, a, as a, right now. So let me jump onto the next bit that we're gonna be moving on to. So here is an example of a sound wave that I've used um, by drawing it out on a piece of paper, which you've seen on the sheet. And I've done it slightly differently in this version because originally um, I did this using uh, pins and I used some um, 
twine to wrap it around it. So you can see here's a sound wave. And the reason, as I said earlier, the Fon autograph worked was because the stylus was made to vibrate from focus sound and actually drew the sound wave of the sound. But this technique won't work for storing data on a computer as the data is continuous. That means it has to be continuous. It has to have, be coming through all the time. For a computer to represent sound, it needs to set to it needs separate pieces of data. So whereas a vibration, it's constantly vibrating, we have to find a way of representing the sound wave by using separate pieces of data. So the computers represent sound by taking regular me measurements of the sound wave called samples. And you can see here, it's been represented by the little pegs in the sound wave. Um, and then the computer joins these points together to recreate the sound wave in the same way as some string is used in this example. So you can see I've linked up this, the different points that I've measured with a um, bit of red string. Digital is a recording format that uses regular measurements of, of a sound wave to recreate the sound, just like here. And a sample is the measurement of the height or the amplitude of a sound wave. And you can see that being represented here by the pegs, which are representing the different measurements of the sound wave, um, of the amplitude of the sound wave. But can you see a problem with the sound wave that I've produced here? The wave that's been recreated from the measurements isn't very accurate. So how could we make the recreated sound wave more accurate? we need to use more samples per second. So you can see here, I've doubled the number of samples per second and added them to the sound wave. And you can see them then filled into the sound wave here. The sound wave has been produced is now much more accurate, but the number of measurements of the sound wave taken per second have doubled it by uh, increasing what we called the frequency. So we call the number of measurements taken per second the frequency. So sample frequency is the number of samples per second in a sound wave. But why not just use lots of, diff of samples? So we've just demonstrated that by having more samples, you can get a more accurate sound, um, more accurate sound wave, and therefore a more accurate sound. But why not just use lots and lots of samples? Now the problem is that everything that's stored on a computer takes up space. The more samples used per second, the higher the sample rate and the bigger the file size and the more space it will need to take it to, to be stored on your computer. So here is an example. You could do this yourself if you've got a bit of Lego at home. Place two eight stud bricks onto a base, a base plate and the bricks represent the operating system and other programs stored on your computer. And the base plate represents the hard drive where everything is stored. The rest of the space is available for you to, to store your music. So you start to add your music, and you, but you need to fit it completely in the hard drive. You can't have a, a song that hangs off the side like this. So your music files start to be filled up um, using the eight stud bricks. How many files can you fit on your hard drive if you start with um, two eight stud bricks that are representing the operating system and any other software that's already installed on your computer? Can you work it out? You can represent six. That's right, you can add six sound files on your computer. So we can work out the bit rate of our sound to work out which version will have the biggest file size. So the reason that we need to think about file size is because we only have a certain amount of space. Once we've completely filled up that hard drive, there's nowhere else to store the music. We can't then add more sound files because there's nowhere to put them. So we need to be aware of the, sound, of the file size whenever we're working with music. In fact, we're working with anything on a computer and we can use the bit rate of the sound to work out which version will have the, the biggest file size. To do this, we need to know the sample frequency, so how, free, how often it's sampled and the sample size, so how many samples per second. Bit rate is the number of bits per second needed to store the sound and the sample size is the number of bits needed to store one measurement of the sound wave. So the version of this sound wave has nine samples per second and a bit depth of four bits. So the bit rate would be, can you work it out? Thirty-six bits per second. So we do nine times four, and that tells us that it would be thirty-six bits per second. That means it would take thirty-six binary ones or zeros to for every second of the sound to be stored. 
Now this version, which we've doubled the frequency, remember, we've got 18 samples per second and a bit depth of four. So what would the bit rate be for this one? So we're doing 18 times four this time. See if you can work it out. It would be 72 bits per second. So you can see the bit rate has a big influence on what the file size will end up being. And if you haven't got a lot of space on your computer or you need to have um, a, small um, a small file for some reason, which sometimes you do need to keep files quite small, looking at the bit rate can be a really good way to make sure that you have the best po possible quality sound within the limits of the amount of data that you can store. There you go, so we work out the file size, you multiply the bit rate by the length of the sound in seconds. So then you can work out the file size in, so in total. So this sound file has a bit rate of 36 bits per second, and the sound is five seconds long. So what would the actual file size be? 36 times five, 180 bits. That gives you your total file size. And this one, which, is, which had 72 bits per second, and the sound is now 10 seconds long, what would the file size be? 72 times 10, 720 bits. Yeah, so you can see how increasing the bit rate has quite a big impact on the file size. Um, and there's always a trade-off between quality and file size. Now let's represent that our sound files have a lower sample rate by using a four stud brick to, brick to represent the sound files. So now if we make our file size half the original size, how many files can you now store on your hard drive? you can now store 12. So we, we've doubled the amount of files that we can store by decreasing their file size. So, but also, we've also decreased the quality of the sound as well. So it's a trade-off. You can store more things, but the quality is not quite as good as it was originally. Okay, so the very last bit that we're gonna look at it very quickly is waveforms. And we're gonna look at this more detail in the next part of the workshop but we're gonna just have a quick look at it now. So how can we create different sounds? We use the waveform, the graphical representation of the shape of the wave to create different sounds. And this is where it links to the quality of the sound as well, because if you've got more samples, you can create a waveform that's more accurate to create the sound of the instrument that you want to create. So here are some examples. This waveform is used to represent the sound of a clarinet, and this is gonna be used with a Labo piano next time. And that is it. That is our whistle stop tour at looking at some of the unplugged activities for learning about how sound is represented on a computer. So in this workshop, you have learned about binary representation of deanery. You've looked at a brief history of digital sound. You've learned how sound can be sampled and stored in a digital form. You've learned how sampling intervals and other factors affect the size of a sound file and the quality of its playback. You've looked at sample size, bit rate and sampling frequency. And we've looked at why you might need to um, compress the size of your files to fit them on your hard drive. So that is really everything for today's workshop. Very well done for completing part one of Switched On Sound. I am going to do a quick sneaky peek of next um, work, the next the next part of the workshop on Friday. And as usual, I'm going to jump over into the chat should you have any questions for me from today's session. So we've really gone into a lot of detail of about sound and how sound's represented on a computer in today's workshop. And it's quite a lot to take in. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm just going to pop into the chat now that um, if you want to ask any questions. Um, so please ask any questions now. And while I'm um, waiting for any questions, I will do a quick sneaky peek for what we're going to be looking at next time. So as I said, um, the next part of the workshop is going to be taking the actual uh, Nintendo Labo piano and having a go at looking at some of the different things that we've talked about today and looking at, again, how that's represented using the piano and learning a little bit more about how those different things work. So, for example, we're going to look at in more detail the different waveforms because I showed you um, the example of the different waveforms that are used for things like the clarinet sound. Um, and we're going to look at different shapes of waveforms and see what um, effect that has on the sounds that the Nintendo Labo piano creates. We're going to be looking at using a punch card and we're going to be controlling um, particular sounds using a punch card. Um, 
on the piano. We're also going to be looking at um, creating sound by using different vibrations and we'll see what happens with that as well. So we're going to take all of the theory that we've learned in today's session and we're going to apply that to using the Nintendo Labo piano. Don't worry if you don't have a piano, there's no reason why you can watch and just enjoy and learn about the different processes that you can do with the piano. But if you do have access to one, then join me with your piano at the, at the ready. Okay, so that's next week's session. Well, not next week, Friday's session. Sorry, I'm over. I'm getting very excited about everything. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's session. I don't have any questions in the chat, so that leaves me just to sign off for today's session and say thank you very much for taking part. I hope you've had fun and learnt something new. If you've enjoyed this workshop, check out our YouTube channel for more follow-along activities. And if you've got any questions or feedback for me, please email dsh at uki.org.uk. Now, we'd love to see you learning computing at home with Digital Schoolhouse. Parents and guardians, please feel free to share any images or videos using the hashtag computing at home on Twitter or on Facebook. Also, for those of you who love writing, Digital Schoolhouse have launched a creative writing competition, which you can find more information about on our website. And don't forget, if you did have a go at representing your own message using the COBOL punch card, I'd love to see that um, being tweeted. So do um, pop that over to me if you had a go at doing that. If you're the parent of a primary age pupil and are interested in finding out about how Digital Schoolhouse can work with your child's school, you can find out more information about our programme on our website, digitalschoolhouse.org.uk. You can find our contact information in the section below or at the end of this video. Lastly, I wanted to say a huge well done for taking part today. I'm Estelle and I look forward to seeing you next time.